so, okay, um, I'll be talking to you about HDR models for cinema. This is very much a work in progress uh, that we're doing with, um, with Josep Blatt from the, um, uh, here the, the Interactive Technologies Group and uh, David Kane and Ricardo Marquez. So, what is this about? So, um, let me start by talking about what's the dynamic range and what is the dynamic range of a camera. So, in general, the dynamic range of a scene is the, you can think of it as the ratio of contrast, uh, as the difference between the brightest and the darkest uh, points in a scene. And you compute this ratio, and that ratio is the dynamic range. And cameras are able to capture a given dynamic range, which is usually much smaller than that of uh, you know, common natural scenes. For instance, this is a picture taken with a you know, regular camera with a short exposure time. We can only see what's outside the window. As we keep increasing the, now we increase the exposure time, and we take another picture, and now we see more. Okay, as we increase the exposure time, we get to see more and more inside. But what's outside gets overexposed, and after some point, we just don't see anything outside. Okay, so why is this happening? Um, well, the response of camera sensors is linear within a range, which you can see there. So from dark to saturation, there's a linear response of sensors. Um, and if a scene so this is the histogram of some scene. It has a lot of, uh, well, it's the histogram of the intensity of the light coming from that scene given the exposure time that you're using, okay? So if the exposure time is short, most of the points will have a very dark value, okay? So as the first picture I showed. As we increase the exposure time, now we get to see more things, but the things that are, let me see if this works, yeah, so, things that are brighter become saturated, okay? And as you increase more the exposure time, the effect, uh, I mean, the area of the saturated pixels is even larger. So, this is problematic uh, in particular, well, in many instances. Um, in particular in cinema, it's problematic because uh, it force you, forces you to uh, introduce artificial lights, which are uh, cumbersome, it's a, uh, a very a time consuming, uh, expensive process. So you, what, one thing that does not work is just to use short exposure times and then boost the gain. So if you do that, noise becomes apparent, like you see here, okay? So it's not, uh, that's not a good practice. So yeah, so what, what people do in, in cinema shoots is they add lights, not only in low light situations like here, but also in, you know, daylight situations. You add artificial light so that the dynamic range is reduced. And that, sorry, that was what I was trying to show here. So if you add lights to the scene, what you get is that uh, the brightest points are not much affected, but the darkest points get brighter. So you reduce that ratio. Remember that the dynamic range was the ratio between the brightest and the darkest points. So if you make the darkest points more illuminated, then that histogram fits within the, uh, the available dynamic range of the scene, which is what you do or when you use a flash. It's exactly the same thing. So um, people do this, uh, cinema crews do this all the time, and that takes uh, a lot of resources away from doing photography for artistic reasons. So there's uh, artificial lights are there um, sometimes or very often so that you can see things properly and often also because you want to express some artistic intent. Uh, but devoting time to this makes less time uh, available for the other or makes the whole process more expensive. Um, like this, you would like to devote all your, you know, available resources to do photography for uh, artistic expression. So, in the, what are the challenges that we, we are um, addressing in, the, in this project? So, the first one is tone mapping. So, um, the dynamic range of cameras is, there's like a, a, an arms race. 
uh, it's ever increasing. So dynamic range of cameras increases and dynamic range of displays increases and so on. So um, this is um, some, um, yeah, like pamphlet from some renting house from 2009 and dynamic range at that time was around, um, you know, between two and three orders of magnitude. Now, this is 2014, it was around 14 orders of magnitude, I'm sorry, uh, 14 stops around uh, three, four orders of magnitude and presently it's getting closer to, to five. Anyway, that's uh, enough in many situations. It's not uh, enough in any general situation. There are common um, natural scenes with a dynamic range of six, seven, hard, higher orders of magnitude. So, uh, but even if you build a camera which is capable of shooting uh, or recording uh, footage with a very high dynamic range, you, that footage, you need to display it. Okay, and the, if you can now, nowadays get a digital cinema camera like that one with a dynamic range of four orders of magnitude, a digital cinema projector can get this, and a home TV can get like two orders of magnitude. Okay, and if you go to a store, uh, people buy, selling you the TV will tell you that's a total lie. We have a contrast of, well, a few years back they will tell you they have uh, millions. Uh, you know, five million to one contrast. Um, that's, uh, that was a lie, not, they're not telling that anymore, but nowadays you can, you can find, you can buy TVs that will tell you, well, the difference in intensity between the brightest and the darkest point is like 5,000 to one. And that is true. But the way you compute that is not in real operation of your TV. When you're, you know, watching images on your TV, uh, in a room, for instance, there's a lot of light bouncing back from you to the screen that bounces back again and so on, and that reduces the effective dynamic range. So it's about that, okay? And definitely it's smaller than the dynamic range of the camera. So there's a, uh, something that has to be done, and it, it's, don't worry, it's, it's done. So all, all the movies that you see have gone through this process by which the um, dynamic range of the footage is reduced so that it's, it fits the dynamic range of displays and of you know, projectors in cinemas. That process has several names. In, uh, here we're calling that tone mapping, which is like uh, the usual term in, in both in computer graphics and, and image processing. So we have to do tone mapping. We have to reduce the dynamic range of the footage so that it fits the, that of this place. And we have to do that preserving the natural appearance of the image. So, um, so what is this? So your, you know, any camera from your cheapest mobile phone camera does the following. It does a nonlinear correction, so it reduces this dynamic range in this manner. So this uh, process is called gamma correction, and it basically uh, consists in passing the footage or you know, your picture, your video, through a nonlinearity we had, which has this shape, okay? And this, is, this replicates how we perceive uh, intensity. So the way we perceive luminosity is not linear with respect to the intensity of the light. It has this nonlinear response, which can be in often, in many cases, well approximated by this, uh, by a power law, okay, of, um, of an exponent uh, of, I don't know, almost one half. Uh, okay, in cinema, though, the, this is not the way this is done. You don't want your camera to take your artistic decisions for you. So what people do in, in cinema shoots is uh, they keep the, uh, the, the information, image information in linear form, they just pass it through a nonlinearity for encoding purposes so that they don't lose in the quantization when the image is digitized. Okay, and that nonlinearity have has a logarithmic shape, but it's only for uh, for encoding. So if you look at so that is what that is just the the representation of what the camera is recording. So it's not ready to be seen. Um, so if you take away that logarithmic encoding and just put the usual gamma correction curve, you would see something like that, 
Okay? This is what your mobile phone or, or any regular camera would do when recording a JPEG uh, or an MPEG video. This is the kind of output that we do. So in cinema, what you do is you keep this you, and you undo the logarithmic encoding in post-production and there's a skilled colorist that goes, does a grading process by which he or she adjusts the contrast and also the color so that you get to see this, for instance. So take a look at the background, okay? It was overexposed here, now it's no longer overexposed. And, okay, so this will be manual tone mapping and manual tone mapping is what's going on in post-production. It's done manually, it's not done by algorithms. So this term mapping is important because if you do not do it right, if you just say, okay, I will show this everything linearly. Well, you don't see anything like, so this image, this is an image in which we have done a linear tone mapping. So zero corresponds to black and one corresponds to white and you don't see anything. Why? Because the histogram is very much skewed to the low values. So there's a peak here in the low intensity and there are some few pixels which are very bright. So if you do proper tone mapping, something like, uh, well, similar to history equalization, you get that. Anyway, another challenge we want to address, uh, merging sources of different dynamic range. So in cinema, so, uh, well, not in cinema. So when you work with, um, with photorealistic synthetic images, uh, so um, this synthetic, 3D scenes are built with very much, very accurate models of how light interacts with objects in the scene. So they're really, really, uh, they can be really, really accurate. And at the end, the final stage is you have a, an image, which is a representation of the light coming from the scene. And you have to pass that through a tone mapping algorithm so that you can see that on your screen. And that's what, you know, um, any, um, you know, software for architecture or some, um, or software for, for video games does. It, it does, it takes this physical reality, I'm sorry, this physical um, approximation of physical um, reality and tone maps the intensity of the light. So, um, but the original scene uh, is high dynamic range. And in, sorry, in cinema, what you usually have is you have, for special effects, for visual effects, you have to mix footage which has different dynamic range. So you can have standard dynamic range or even low dynamic range for your actors. And you have to combine that with high dynamic range um, CGI generated objects. And you have to do that properly. And that's done, so some examples there. Um, that has to be done uh, manually through some very much, uh, well, so through s professional software tools for post-production, like some of them you can see here. So another challenge we are very, very much interested in is image quality assessment. So let's say, well, our goal is to do uh, a tone mapping method which uh, is automatic and it matches in terms of visual appearance what a skilled colorist does in post-production. That's our ultimate goal. But in order to address if, whether or not we have reached that goal, we have to validate our results. Uh, so we need to do some image quality assessment for the tone mapping. And it turns out that there are very, very few um, objective, um, I'm sorry, quantitative metrics for assessing the quality of tone mapping. Actually, I'm only aware of two. I mentioned one. So here, um, this is the metric of aiding et al from 2008. Um, so what they do here is they use um, models of visual perception that have been computed. Um, so these models of visual perception are derived from uh, experimental psychophysical data in which people are presented with artificial stimuli like gratings and, and gabors and um, with different uh, levels of detail and luminosity. And these people are asked, uh, do you see this change? Do you not see the, this change? So 
the, uh, this allows uh, allow the researchers to compute uh, thresholds of visibility of change. So in this manner, with this, what this metric does is it takes as input a high dynamic range image and its tone mapped version and compares the visibility of details. So if, they are, if there are details which are visible in the high dynamic range scene but not visible in the tone mapped, tone mapped scene, they paint that with, they represent that with green. If the opposite is the case, if there are things you cannot see in the high dynamic range scene, but you can see in the tone mapped version, they represent that with blue. And red here represents inversion of contrast. If something that was, uh, you know, a boundary going up, it turns out, I mean, a difference of intensity that goes up, now it, in the, in the tone map uh, image it goes down, that's represented by red. So in this manner, you can, uh, this metric allows you to see, to gauge which are the changes of visibility in the tone mapped image, like for instance here. So this is on the left, a tone mapped image, and on the right, the error. There's a lot of error in terms of loss of visibility rep represented by green. Anyway, this is a very useful metric. Um, it, it correlates well with visual perception. Uh, I'm sorry, with, with the opinion of, um, of subject. Uh, it but it has not been thoroughly validated and we have found that it does, uh, it could be improved. So it correlates well, it, it, it could correlate much better. So there are moments, or I'm sorry, there are times uh, in which uh, you apply this metric uh, and estimate that the quality of a tomb image is uh, very good, but people do not really find that image that good. And the opposite can also be the case. So there's um, really much, um, well, one further point, this metric only considers contrast, it does not consider color. And color is very, very important in how you gauge the appearance of an image, the quality. So another challenge, therefore, is to uh, develop a quality, an image quality metric to assess tone mapping results. So for instance, you have here different tone mapped results and here the errors according to this metric. So our previous work, um, we have, uh, I'll go very quickly through this. So one thing that happens is in the human eye, light bounces inside it and this has the effect of reducing the effective dynamic range. So even if we are seeing uh, looking at the scene which has a very high dynamic range, the dynamic range of the retinal image, that the, the image that forms in a retina, is very much reduced. And that's good for us, actually, because it, it gives us hope that we can do a, um, a proper um, tone mapping algorithm using the limited dynamic range uh, of the footage of cameras. So this is an example of a retinal image. Uh, well, I, I don't have time to go deeply into that, but the retinal image is def definitely not the final word. I mean, it, our visual system does a lot of processing in the, on the retinal image and uh, it, um, it's able to recover m many of the apparently lost details that we think you know, are uh, unrecoverable here, but well, they can be recovered. Uh, but the, our point is that you start with something which is limited in dynamic range. Uh, so this is just to highlight that, in effect, the dynamic range of uh, retinal images is reduced. So we did this work, which has uh, yeah appeared uh, this year, uh, in which we so we were uh, presenting. Um, we were asking people to judge the quality of, uh, of images as we varied a different number of um, uh, variables. And we, find, we found um, a significant correlation between the uh, image quality uh, that people reported and the level of um, uniformity of the lightness histogram of the scene. Uh, and that allowed us to, you know, derive several conclusions regarding the, you know, the, the gamma curve that both the encoding and the display should have and also uh, to 
touch upon the uh, effect of the background and the surround of the image on the per uh, perception of the image. So um, we derived a, another thing that we did is we, we developed a tone mapping algorithm that is uh, based on natural image statistics and basic principles of human visual perception. Um, this is also a work from this year, electronic imaging. So it, one, one uh, principle that it's, it repeats itself in several stages of, um, in, of the human visual system is that of efficient representation. So um, the availability of resources is limited, so there's a lot of processing that is done in order to uh, optimize the, um, uh, the way these resources are used and, the, and optimize the results that are produced with these limited resources. So one thing that is done is that um, given that the response of photoreceptors is limited, uh, photoreceptors have a response which does uh, which is nonlinear and does sort a sort zero zero minutes. Great. Um, okay. So thank you very much. Um, anyway, so photoreceptors do do a sort of histone equalization on the on the input, and this is an average of um, the histogram of natural images, and um, in log log coordinates. So what we did here in this work is we took so this is computed from photographs. Okay, and natural photographs, and this is the average histogram. So we said, let's create a nonlinear curve which would flatten the histogram of a typical image, which would have this typical histogram. So this is basically what we did. And so this method of ours has uh, some parameters which adjust on an image-dependent manner automatically. Okay, and after that we do contrast enhancement, which is also um, related to a, a very um, ubiquitous principle in, in, in human vision, which is that of um, divisive normalization. Okay, and so this is tone mapping algorithm based on, on vision models and natural image statistics, and we get results, which, so this is a JPEG image, what you would get, and this is what we get applying our algorithm to the raw image. Okay, again, JPEG, and this is what we get applying our algorithm to the raw image, which is very close to what a skilled colorist would achieve. Uh, so that's that's good, but the problem is very much uh, not uh, closed. Why is that? Well, okay, so there's uh, there's very few high dynamic range image databases. This is one of the most popular one by uh, Mark Fairchild. And it has like 108 images and properly taken and calibrated and so on. So it's, it's great, but it's not enough for doing statistics like we are basing our model on. So some examples of those images. So this is the you know, the uh, average histogram, but it turns out that if you take this database, some, his some image has this histograms here are in blue. This histogram, which resembles that shape, but you can have bimodal distributions or these weirdly shaped ones. So we want to improve our model, um, I'm sorry, we want to improve our model, which is based on statistics. We need a large database of high dynamic range images. Taking high dynamic range images properly is very, very, very complicated. It's time consuming, you have to do it very carefully. It's, uh, it's not straightforward at all. So what we're doing now is we take, we're taking um, uh, the graphics approach. We are producing synthetic scenes and in which is very much simple to change the light, okay? And what we found is the following. Uh, this is the distribution of um, median luminance versus dynamic range in this um, database that I mentioned. It has this very interesting negative correlation. And we have found, these are very preliminary results, that with synthetic scenes, you can get the same behavior, okay? So that's a good start. 
So our goal would be to produce um, high dynamic range images synthetically, millions of them, okay, from which to derive statistics which are more accurate, which can then be used by us to improve our model, which is based on natural image statistics. So first we have to ensure that the natural image statistics that we can derive with synthetic scenes match the statistics of real natural scenes. So this is our example of, you can see there how the median, uh, how that behavior there of the median luminance versus dynamic range changes as we change the light, okay. All right, so thank you, everybody. Maybe while Emilia is setting up, we can. Yes. Would it be possible to create your database by collecting photographs available on the web? By collecting photographs available on the web, would that be possible or is uh, not possible? Will you have to analyze them in order to decide whether they are suitable for your research? Or? Um, well, uh, no. It would not be possible in the sense that we have to uh, ensure that things are done properly. So we need, uh, we need a scenes that, that are... Um, so th the usual manner in which high dynamic range images are created is the following. You take differently exposed pictures, that the ones I showed at the beginning, and then you fuse them, okay? And this sounds simple enough. It's really, uh, if you want to do it properly, you have to be extremely careful. So misalignments are very problematic. The way you fuse them, I mean, if you change weights, your results can change. I mean, the weights that you give to different images, the results are changing appreciably. So if you give, uh, so the dark images are noisy and the overexposed images, uh, well, they are exposed, so you have to leave out those values. Plus you have to calibrate, you have to go to the scene and measure the actual, with a photometer, the actual amount of light. So um, I'm not aware of people doing that on a systematic basis. So maybe some, someone has done that and posted that on the web, uh, but what usually is called HDR images on the web is actually not HDR images, it's the tone mapping result, which is also usually done just for artistic purposes. So you get something that does not look natural, it looks weird with halos and so on, and that's what many people in, in Flickr, for instance, call uh, HDR. <laughs>